Hello, I'm Mark Payne. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the West Virginia Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. These presentations are both entertaining and educational. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to nonprofit organizations across West Virginia, such as schools, libraries, historical societies, and a wide range of civic groups. Their presentation fee is paid by the council, and we ask only that their travel costs be covered by the host group. History Alive is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. We encourage your organization or school to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Pearl Buck or Chief Logan come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures and make them more real. Nothing compares to the live, in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question-answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. The presenters on our History Live roster have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Live presentation is not a play. It is very much an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Live presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we will change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give a sample of how a History Live presentation can add to the offerings at your school or organization. There will be information on the screen at the end of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Live character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio the first woman candidate for the presidency of the United States, Victoria Woodall. This little campaign button is the only thing I have left to remind me of my campaign for president. You all know that I ran for president back in 1872. My opponents were the current president, Ulysses S. Grant, and Horace Greeley, the newspaper man. Now, I know that I could have been a much better president than either of those men, but as you know, I didn't win. If I had have won, I would be doing things a lot differently than they are now. I've about given up on the drive for women's votes. Here it is, 1877, five years after the election, and women still can't vote. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about my life, and maybe you'll understand why I've just decided to, to quit fighting for women's suffrage. What I remember about my childhood was being in my father's medicine show. He was, he was a spiritualist, and my mother was, and I am too. I've been told by some of the older members of my family that my parents went to one of those big tent meetings right before I was born, and they were, they were converted to spiritualism. Now, the point of this is there's a big connection between spiritualism and the medicine show. When you are a spiritualist, there are certain t powers that you get. One of the primary ones is that we spiritualists can, can contact deceased people. Let's say you wanted to know how your brother George was getting along. I could arrange a seance and act as a medium, and I could contact him. Well, I can also tell your fortune, and I can do magnetic healing. And my father, Buck, he figured out right away that people would pay for these services. And that's when he started his medicine show. Well, I was only five years old. My sister, Tenny, was four. They dressed us all up in these pretty little dresses, and we had to dance and sing to draw in customers. By the time I was 10, I was telling fortunes. By the time I was 15, I was, I was doing magnetic healing, I was telling fortunes, and I was, I was contacted the spirits. And I'll tell you one thing, I was sick of this medicine show. I wanted to live a normal life. I thought about running away like one of my brothers did, but instead I started pretending like I was sick. Why, I could develop an actual fever 
and I would be too sick to go to work. I could even faint. Well, pretty soon my father caught on to this, and he brought a doctor in to give me an examination to see if I really was sick. <clears throat> well, the doctor he brought was a Dr. Channing Woodall. Dr. Woodall told my father that all I needed was plenty of rest, a daily walk, and lots of good food. And Dr. Woodall started coming by to take me on this daily walk. Well, I could spend hours talking about him, but I don't want to waste my breath. Let me just tell it to you in one sentence. Dr. Woodall and I fell in love. We eloped. We moved to Cleveland. We had two children. And I learned right away that a woman needed to be able to take care of herself and not depend on a man. So I took the children and I moved to St. Louis and I vowed I would never, never get married again. That is, until I met Colonel James Harvey Blood. You see, in St. Louis, I had set up my own practice. Colonel Blood came into my office one day, introduced himself, told me he was president of the St. Louis Society of Spiritualists and he wanted me to tell his fortune. So I clasped his hands and I closed my eyes and I went into a trance, and when I came out, I looked him right in the eye, and I said, Colonel Blood, I see our futures linked. Well, he agreed. Within a month, he had divorced his wife, and he and I and my two children went to Dayton, Ohio. Now, we didn't go to Dayton, Ohio to live. It's entirely too cold up there, but it was the only city in Ohio that would let divorced persons remarry. And while we were in Dayton, we were discussing, what, what could we do? Where did we want to live our lives? We both wanted to start over. We decided that we would go to New York City. And I sent a telegram to my sister, Tenny, and I, I asked her to meet us in New York, because I knew that she wanted to get away from my father, too. Well, we went to New York, we rented rooms, and within days, Colonel Blood had an editorial position on a newspaper. When Tenny arrived, we set up our own spiritualist practice, and we were doing very well. We met a man whose name I'm sure you all know, Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was a fellow spiritualist. He was also one of the richest men in America. And we made his acquaintance, and I used to give him financial advice. Oh, for example, if, if he wanted to buy the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, for example, he would say, Victoria, tell me the future of that railroad. And I would, and my advice was very valuable to him. In fact, it got so valuable that he said to me, why don't you set up a brokerage firm on Wall Street? He said, I will, I will back you. I will even give you a portrait of myself to put in your lobby. Kenny and I talked it over and we said, of course. And so we formed Woodall and Claflin Incorporated, brokers and bankers. Oh, the press went wild. They called us the Queens of Wall Street. On our opening day, we had over 400 people come into the office. One of those was Susan B. Anthony, the suffrage leader. And she didn't come to buy stock. She came to convince me to join her in the women's suffrage movement. And I thought it over and I said, absolutely, I believe that women should have the right to vote. I believe that women should have equal rights in all aspects of life. Well, Miss Anthony took me to several meetings where I met some of the leaders of the suffrage movement, including the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher. Oh, you've heard of him the famous pastor of the Plymouth Church, Congregation 2000, and he was president of the American Women's Suffrage Association. I couldn't understand why a man needed to be president of a women's organization, but I'll tell you more about him later. I began thinking, what could I do to really help the women's movement to secure the vote? And I decided that I would run for president now, no woman had ever done that before, and no woman has done it since. I wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Herald, and I told him that I stood 
for the great unenfranchised body of American women, and that I would run as a candidate of the Equal Rights Party in the election of 1872. Oh, he published my letter, and he put a little footnote, and he said, if women could vote, Miss Woodall would win. We got the idea that I should write a series of articles for his newspaper, expressing my beliefs. And I thought, Colonel Blood has newspaper experience. Why should I write for another paper? We'll start our own paper. We called it Woodall and Claflin's Weekly. And I wrote a number of articles. But one of my best articles came out in November of 1870. And it was called The Memorial of Victoria C. Woodall. And in it, I said, nowhere in the Constitution does it say men can vote, women can't vote. It doesn't mention gender. It says all persons born or naturalized in the United States are subject to the rights and privileges of citizens. Persons, not men, not women. Well, that article got a lot of attention. I received a telegram from the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee inviting me to come to Washington and deliver my memorial in front of his committee. Now, no woman had ever spoken before Congress. And I was nervous, but I knew that it was important to the cause of women's suffrage that I go to Washington. In January of 1871, I delivered my memorial before the Judiciary Committee, and I got a standing ovation. I even got a note from President Grant saying that he wanted to meet me. Oh, I'm just a little country girl from Ohio, and now I'm meeting with the President? I walked into his office, he got up, he came across the room, he shook my hand, and he pointed to his chair, and he said, someday, my dear, you will occupy that chair. Well, you can see that things are just going very, very well. We had a brand new home on Murray Hill that we were renting. Our brokerage firm was making money. Our newspaper was increasing in subscriptions daily. And the suffrage leaders were all on my side. And then something happened that I read about in the paper. My mother, Roxy Clayfin, sued my husband, Colonel Blood, for trying to kill her. Now, my mother is eccentric. But this was more than anything she had ever done before. I tried to calm her down. I said, we can't go to court. Oh, yes, we will, she said. And so we went to court. My mother got on the stand, and she was pacing back and forth, and she was stopped all of a sudden, and she pointed at me, and she said, that woman is living with two husbands. Oh, you can imagine the uproar in the courtroom. When I got on the stand, I explained the situation. I said my former husband, Dr. Woodall, came by our house. He was feverish. He was about ready to faint, and he begged us to take him in. And we did. And it was an act of compassion, not what my mother made it, believe, made it sound like. Well, the papers the next day headlined Woodall living with two husbands. And from that time on, we, we began to have great difficulties. People withdrew their accounts from our brokerage firm, and we had to close. People dropped their subscriptions from our newspaper. We were evicted from our home on Murray Hill. And the great Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, he spoke out against us every Sunday. Even the Commodore turned his head away from us. And it was to the place where we were, we were destitute. We, we needed money. All the lectures I had scheduled were canceled. And I talked to Colonel Blood, and I said, I am going to write a lecture that will sell tickets. Now, I got 10 cents for each ticket that was sold. I rented Steinway Hall, seated 3,000 people. And I wrote a lecture that I called The Principles of Social Freedom. I went throughout the city, putting up signs, announcing my lecture. I said that I would speak about marriage, divorce, free love, and prostitution. Nobody ever talks about those subjects. I sold 3,000 tickets. And then I went to visit the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher. 
And I said to him that I wanted him to introduce me so it would show the public that he was a supporter of mine. Ha, oh, he laughed. He said, I'm not going to introduce you. I said, if you don't, I will expose the affair you are currently having with Elizabeth Tilton. Oh, his face changed. He got pale and he started to shake. He said, oh, of course, I will introduce you. Well, the night of the lecture, I was standing backstage going through my notes. At 8 o'clock, I heard people pounding on the floor and yelling my name. And the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher was not there to introduce me. And I walked on that stage alone. Colonel Blood and I got money together to publish a special edition of Woodall and Claflin's Weekly. And in it, I exposed the affair that the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher was having with Elizabeth Tilton. We printed 100,000 copies. We mailed copies to all of our former subscribers. And then Tenny and I put the rest of the newspapers in our carriage and we were going around the downtown area distributing them to the newsstands when we were surrounded by United States Marshals. And we were told that we were being arrested for mailing obscenities through the United States mail. I told the marshal that we did not mail obscenities, that we mailed the truth. Well, that didn't matter. They took us to the Ludlow Street Jail, cell number 11. There was $8,000 bail on each one of us. This was on November 2nd. 1872, three days before the election. I spent election day, November 5th, in jail. I did not receive a single recorded vote. The next morning, Colonel Blood was able to get together $16,000 by selling practically everything we owned, and he, he got me out on bail in Tenney. Two hours later, we were rearrested on slightly different charges. This happened seven times. We were arrested out on bail and rearrested, and finally, all charges were dropped. And then, oh, I was in demand on the lecture tour. I went 150 nights in a row. I started in New York, I went to Washington, to Philadelphia, to Pittsburgh, to Wheeling, West Virginia, every day for 150 days. And when I came home, I was exhausted. And I was discouraged, because nobody wanted to listen to my message. All they wanted to do was heckle me. Are you still living with two husbands? And I decided that I would give up the fight for women's vote in America, and that I would leave and take my family and live in England. I'm here with Victoria Woodhall. Ms. Woodhall, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, start by asking you if you could uh, share with us a little bit of information about, you had talked about your early days when you uh, traveled with a medicine show and of course mm -hmm. your, your days and work as a spiritualist. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, let me tell you about the spiritual, the uh, spiritualist first. Uh, because that's key to mm -hmm. the um, medicine show. My parents were converted to spiritualism back around, it would have been around 1837 when it was sweeping the country. And they learned to do, my mother in particular, learned to do the certain powers that I described. Mm -hmm. And my father figured out that people would pay for it. So he got a wagon and we had a medicine show uh, I was born in Homer, Ohio, and we would, we would go from small town to small town. So I never really got to go to school. I would go for maybe two or three months during the winter, and then my father would get the idea that it's time to go to Gilead. So we would pack up the family and we would go to Gilead, Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, we went into Kentucky some, we went into uh, Virginia, and I just never had a place I could call home. Mm -hmm. And I, I never got to go to school except briefly. And you, how many uh, 
brothers and sisters did you have? Well, there were eight of us all together. Now, I mentioned that my brother ran away. One of my brothers ran away, and we never did see him again. Hmm. I never heard from him. Never heard from him, nothing. Hmm. Um, I know that you had, uh, during your talk and your, your remarks earlier, you mentioned that uh, at one point in your life, your, your mother sued your husband for attempted murder. Could you tell me a little bit about that? You'd, you'd almost have to know my mother. My mother is very emotional. And, and sometimes she just goes off on these tangents and, and there's just no controlling her. Now she was very jealous that my sister Tenny and I were, were drawn to Colonel Blood. She wanted, she wanted herself and my sister and I just to travel the country doing a medicine show. And she didn't want anything to do with Colonel Blood. So she came up with this idea that he tried to kill her. And, and, and he didn't. He, oh, was, so he may have thought about it, but he didn't, no. he didn't do <laughs> he it. He didn't act on it, huh? So no, that was no. essentially then just a trumped up charge. Oh, you... it was a trumped up charge. And, and the court dismissed the charge after hearing all the things that she said. So did, your, did you and your mother reconcile after that, or what was your relationship like we after did, that? We did. We reconciled. Uh, I understood that she was just a jealous woman, and she wanted me all to herself, and, and, um, and we did reconcile. Hmm. Um, you also spoke about uh, your sort of public, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, maybe uh, battle or controversy with uh, Henry Ward Beecher and uh, his uh, his um, affair. Right, right. Uh, how did you, uh, was that public information, or it, how, how did it, you learn about uh, his his affair with Elizabeth Tilton? Well, it, it's sort of an involved story. I was friends with the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, to a degree, and also with Theodore Tilton. Now, Theodore Tilton was president of the National Women's Suffrage Association. And Henry Ward Beecher, as I mentioned, was president of the other association. Theodore Tilton went on a four-month tour, lecture tour. He went all the way to California through Texas. He was gone for four months. When he came home, his wife was pregnant. And he came to my house, and he was crying and, and telling me, and he actually took me over to his home, and the three of us had a discussion, and she did reveal that the child did belong to the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher. Uh, so that's how I knew. No. Um, <clears throat> uh, and and your, your work in the uh, suffrage movement, uh, I know, was, was extensive. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, uh, some of your activities with, with that? And, and, and you knew Susan B. Anthony? Right. Primarily, I did uh, lectures. I was in demand as, as a lecturer. And I also did a lot of writing. And I also uh, did a lot of attempting to vote. If there was an election, a group of us would go and we would try to vote. And of course, we would be refused. And that was to point out that women did not have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. now, so you were on the ballot uh, against uh, Ulysses Grant. Did you, were you hopeful of, of uh, did you think you could win? You know, I think I could have win, could, could win if women could vote, but women couldn't vote. Hmm. I think I would have had a chance. Now, basically, it was a way to make a statement. There had been other women that had run for like a local office or state office, but I decided I'd just go for the top. Well, and it a, made a, an impression. Uh, starting at the top is, is, is okay. At this time, I would like to introduce the presenter of Victoria Woodall. This is Ms. Betty Levengood from Parkersburg. Betty, thanks for being here with us today. Thank you. I'm getting on my real glasses <laughs> so I can see It's you. all coming into focus now. Yes. Isn't it? Okay. Well, I, believe me, I understand. There. I understand the need. Well, you're a good-looking uh, gentleman. Well, you silver-tongued <laughs> devil, you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you this, the first, the same question I ask all of our uh, History Live guests, which is, what was it that compelled you uh, to, and, and, and piqued your interest about Victoria Woodall to move you to uh, research her and, and portray her? 
You know, I don't remember exactly where I first heard of her, but it was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was election time, and I learned that there had been this Victoria Woodall that ran for president. And I wrote an article about her, and I just got interested. And now there's a lot of discussion about Hillary Clinton running for president. So I thought it would be a good time to emphasize that we did have a woman run for president. In fact, we've had many, mm -hmm. but Victoria Woodall was the first. Mm -hmm. And what year, what, what year was that election? Can you remember? Was it 1870? Oh, it was the election of 1872. 1872 right. was when she ran against, uh, ran against Grant. Um, so what were some of the, how did you research her? What were some of the sources that you went to to learn about her so that you could put together this, this uh, portrayal? It was kind of interesting. The, the first book I read was written in 1928. Victoria died in 1927. Uh, the very next year, uh, a lady wrote this very critical book of Victoria Woodall. It was called The Terrible Siren. Nobody wrote anything about her until 1996 when uh, several people started writing books about Victoria. And so I basically have read all the, there have been about five books that have come out in the last 10 years. Uh, what, do you have a, an idea as to why there was this dearth of, of information or, or, or writing about her for so long? I think people just uh, read just the 1928 book and thought, oh, she's not anybody that I want to learn any more about. Because the 1928 book was extremely critical of Victoria. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And what was the what was the the uh, gist of the criticism? Oh, that she was um, um, a scandalous woman, you might say. That she had relations with many men. Uh, that she just did all sorts of uh, unethical things. And in, in her in her newspaper in her. People accused her of, of not buying stock, you know, when, when she had the brokerage firm, but mm. pocketing the money. Is that true? No, that isn't true. Okay, this is the book that was written in the 20s is just sort of a little off base then. It was a, it was a lot off base, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so she, she moved to England, and was, that move, was, the, was the move uh, that caused uh, by all this controversy that, that she had to go through um, did that drive her to England, do you think? Well, that, there's a little bit more to the story. Uh, she was getting tired of, of all the ridicule that she was getting in America, but remember Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt? Mm -hmm. When he died, he had 10 children. He left nine of those children a mere $100,000. He left William the rest of it. So there was the lawsuit. Um, William wanted to prove that uh, his father was of sound mind. And he talked to Victoria. And to make a long story real short, Victor uh, Victoria received $100,000 from William if she would just go to England and be quiet. <laughs> so. OK. Well, once again, I, I, uh, Betty Levengood, I want to thank you thank for being you. here with us on the History Live today. Welcome to our roster of History Live thank characters. You. And thank you for tuning in to History Alive. <laughs>